<laughs> our sound people, our camera people are rolling and running, and so are we. Amen. Praise the Lord this morning. God is so good. Welcome to all of you that are watching online. We just say welcome to our service this morning. Thank you for joining us. God is so good. So good. You know, um, we were practicing our songs this morning, and and the first song we're going to sing, the second line says, um, what does it say? The, when sorrow comes to steal the joy I own. And a lot of times um, in my head, it was always when sorrow comes to steal the joy I've known. But his joy we own in us. Amen. We have that joy this morning to pull it out of us, to rejoice in Him, to know that He has us in the palm of His hand. He's looking after us. He knows every part of it. And what He wants us to do is pull out that joy and rejoice in Him this morning. Praise Him this morning. I encourage you, you are watching online, pull out that joy that is in you. It belongs to you. So I encourage us all this morning. We're not going to sing with sullen faces. We're not going to rejoice and worship. We're going to get the joy of the Lord in us today. Because He is our victory. Amen? Let's stand. Let's begin this morning by rejoicing in Him. Lord, we praise You this morning. We praise You that Jesus, we have the joy of the Lord in us. And in one scripture it says the joy of the Lord is our strength. And Lord, there's times when we need your strength in our lives to bring out what you have in store for us. The goodness of God, the miracles of God. And I praise you today that we are stirring that up. And Lord God, we are expecting. Today we expect the goodness of God to, re to, re to be in us, to re revive us, Lord. To re replenish our thoughts, to know the word of God. And to know it's alive in us today. Lord, I praise you. I thank you. You have blessed this service. We have come to you before in our prayer, Lord Jesus. And said, pour out. Pour out your Holy Spirit on every heart today. Let everyone know the presence of God wherever they are. Wherever they're watching it. Lord God, let them know that they are the healed. They are the delivered. They are the set free. The joy of the Lord is their strength today, and we praise you for it in your precious holy name. Amen. Let's just give him praise this morning. You are worthy, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are worthy, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. We praise you, Lord. When darkness tries to roll over my bones. Sorrow comes to steal the joy I own. When brokenness and pain is all I know, I won't be shaken. I won't be shaken. Cause fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Fear doesn't stand a chance. a place to hide and I am not a captive to the lies I'm not afraid to leave my past behind cause I won't be shaken I won't be shaken lift your voice and sing fear doesn't stand the chance when I stand Stand a chance when I stand in your love. No fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. 
declare there is power now. There's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty out a grave. Yes, there is. There's resurrection power that can save. There's power in your name. Power in your name. There's power. There's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty out a grave. Resurrection. There's resurrection power that can save. There's power in your name. Power in your name. Because yeah. my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Now fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. No fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. No fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Fear doesn't stand a chance in your love. Yes, we declare victory, Jesus. And we declare now, bye bye, fear. You can't stay here. Look where I'm standing. Bye bye, fear. You can't stay here. Look where I'm standing. Bye bye, fear. You can't stay here. Look where I'm standing. You can't stay here. Look where I'm standing. Bye bye, fear. You can't stay here. Look where I'm standing. Bye bye, fear. You can't stay here. Look where I'm standing. We're going to declare that again over our life. Hallelujah. How many knows the enemy's only real weapon is fear and intimidation? You ever had him try to put fear on your body and on your mind and on your spirit? Well, the word says God is love and perfect love casts out all fear. One of the biggest lies of the enemy is to tell us that it's okay to have fear and we're going to have fear. No, no. We don't have to have fear standing in the love of God. Hallelujah. So I want you to look at the enemy because he is the source of fear. And I want you to declare right now that you can't stay here. Sing it now. Bye bye fear. You can't stay here. Look where I'm standing. Bye bye fear. You can't stay here. Look where I'm standing. Bye bye fear. You can't stay here. Look where I'm standing, sing it by by fear. You can't stay here. Look where I'm standing, by by fear. You can't stay here. Look where I'm standing, by by fear. You can't stay here. Look where I'm standing. This is how I fight my battles. With my praise now, this is how I fight my battles. Yeah, yeah. This is how I fight my battles. This is how, this is how I fight my battles. It may look like Satan. now. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Yeah, yeah. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Sing it again. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. 
This is how I fight my battles. This is how I. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. Yeah, yeah. This is how I fight my battles. Hallelujah, Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. This is how I fight my battles. When I go to praise, oh, I'm fighting. We worship you, Lord Jesus. This is how we I fight my Hallelujah. You are our strength. Hallelujah. This is how I fight my battles. You are our everything this morning. Our deliverer. Our provider. This is how I fight my our battle. Oh, Jesus, we praise you today. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded, surrounded by you. you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Oh, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Oh, somebody's gonna sing that again. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Surrounded by This is how I fight my battles. Yes, it is. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. Just your voice is raised in praise, sing. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I sing it again. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I. One more time we sing. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I. Can we just do that for a moment? Just lift up your voice and give him praise this morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, that we look Jesus, to the left and the right. You, Jesus. You are there with us, Jesus. Praise God. Praise hallelujah, God. hallelujah, hallelujah, oh, hallelujah. We worship you this morning, Lord. We worship. No matter where we turn, there you are, Jesus. We're not in this love and the love, Lord Jesus. We're not fighting by ourselves. You are with us, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. We have 
life to There is nobody time. like you. There is nobody like you, Jesus. Precious.
more time how great how great is our God sing sing with me how great is our God and don't Chases me down, fights till I'm found. 
minutes to worship him and praise him for every victory that every challenge that we face God you have already met every need for it you have delivered us you have set us free from everything Lord God that would try to challenge us in this life 
it doesn't belong to us anymore. But your peace belongs to us. Your joy belongs to us. Your strength belongs to us. It is ours to have and take hold of. So today and this day forth, we take hold of everything that you have given us, Lord God. We stand and we walk by faith. This is how we fight our battles today. This is how we fight what the enemy tries to break down and destroy. We stand on the living word of God. We know the revelation power, the resurrection power that is alive in us. And Lord, I thank you that you reveal it to us, to the ones who are watching online, to the ones that can't be here this morning. Lord, strength rises as we wait upon you this day. And Lord Jesus, I know that you are our Savior, our King of kings, our Lord of lords, and you will not fail us. You're holding on to us, and we're holding on to your righteous right hand the hand that doesn't fail the strength that is always there for us I give you the praise and the glory looking after every need as we worship you as we praise you that never ending ever ending never ending flow let it rise up in us today in the name of Yeshua we speak Yeshua speak your power in the name of Jesus let's sing it again let's sing it again
Nobody can love me like you do, Jesus. No one can love me like you do. Father, we just lift up the giving before you this morning. We thank you for giving seed to the sower and placing it on the hearts of them that receive that seed to sow back into your kingdom. Because that's why we sow, to see your kingdom grow, to see your kingdom flourish, and to do your work. Lord, we thank you for the blessings that come back from it. Not that we have earned it, but just because we've been obedient to your word. And when we're obedient to your word, you follow your word. We thank you for it and multiply where it came from, multiply where it sits and where it goes to expand and increase your kingdom. In Jesus' name. How I love Jesus. Oh. How I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because He first That's a simple song that we've sang since we were kids, but what an understanding and a line. He first loved me. Hallelujah. And he knew me. He knew everything about me. He knew every mistake I'd make. He knew every bad decision I'd make. He knew all my faults. He knew all my shortcomings. He knew absolutely every time that I would be disobedient to him. He knew every time that I would walk away. He knew all of it. But he didn't love me because of who I am. He loved me in spite of who I am. He loved me because of who he is. And that love 
was so powerful that the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave. Hallelujah. Can we just take a second and thank him again for his love? We worship you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Don't forget just a few announcements uh, before we go to the Word this morning. Service Sunday at 10, of course. Don't forget Tuesday at 7. We have Bible study and a time of prayer and worship following that. The last Tuesday of every month, of course, is Worship Tuesday. Uh, be, be here for that. We just have a tremendous time in His presence, so don't forget that as well. Don't forget the Today I Ate feeding program, the Pepsi Tim Hortons tin at the back um, that's feeding a lot of kids every day in Mexico. And remember that if you want to give uh, online, you can give... Uh, through Chinook Bible Church at gmail.com and just tag it on there for the Mexican feeding program or today I ate program or in person. Of course, you can always let uh, give it to Dave or Beth in person, so remember that in prayer as well. We announced it last week. We're looking for people who would like to volunteer and minister and have uh, enjoy part of the ministry of the church. We're going to put up a cleaning schedule for volunteers. And so we have a few that have already uh, expressed their interest in doing that. So if you'd like to be a part of that, or if you wouldn't like to be a part of that, but you still know that it's something necessary to be done and you would like uh, to volunteer your time uh, every few weeks to do that, just let me know and we will put you on the list for sure. Hallelujah. Everyone say this with me. God is great. Hallelujah. God is great and greatly to be praised. Hallelujah. Turn with me to James chapter 1. Hallelujah. I'm going to do something over the next few weeks. It's nice to see them running to get to Sunday school. <laughs> um, I'm going to do something over the next few weeks that it's not actually something I do very often. I can't remember a time that I've done it, but I've just felt this in my spirit all week long. And we're going to take the next few weeks, and as opposed to having a theme or as opposed to having, you know, that kind of an idea, we're just going to go through the book of James. We're going to take a few weeks and just go through the book of James. James is, a, is an amazing book. Um, I call James the life book. The reason I call it the life book is because it really is, perhaps, and I don't want to get into comparisons and things, but for, for my, the bang for my buck, as they say, it, it's the most um, simple yet extensive book in the New Testament that is just filled with lessons and instructions for us on how to live our life as Christians, as children of God. I mean, some of the stuff it deals with in James deals with how to deal with adversity, what our faith looks like, how we deal with people bridling our tongue. We'll get to that one. <laughs> bridling our tongue. Uh, um, you know, the, the power of prayer, the power of calling on others to pray for you, the, the development of our hearts towards God. It just deals with so many things. And sometimes I think, um, I read a statistic the other day, and I just, it was saddening, almost hard to believe, but yet believable at the same time. And in the U.S., they, they polled 1,600 churches in the U.S. 1,600 churches, they polled members of the churches, completely anonymous, so their hope was honesty, <laughs> right? But they polled 1,600 churches, and I believe, if I remember correctly, it was around 70% of the people that were in these 1,600 churches had acknowledged that between Sunday and Sunday, they don't even open their Bible. Think about that. They don't even read the Scripture between Sunday to Sunday. And I've said this before, but it's, it's, it's important for us to remember, uh, as a preacher on a Sunday morning, as a pastor on a Sunday morning, or whoever stands behind the podium on a Sunday morning in this church or any other church, they are not giving you enough on a Sunday morning to feed you for a week. Come on. 
Sometimes we think we can just live off of that Sunday morning meal that we receive, but eat, eat once on Sunday morning, have, have lunch on Sunday at noon, and then don't eat a meal for the rest of the week and see how you feel around Wednesday or Thursday. Right? So we have to have that word in us all the time. And sometimes as, as Christians, we kind of become reliant on messages. We become reliant on portions of Scripture. But I think the art of actually studying the Word of God is an art that the enemy has tried to an act rather, that the enemy has tried to take out of the life of the believer. Because the Bible says, study... Go ahead, you can do it louder than that. Study to show yourself approved before God. A workman rightly dividing the word of truth. And if we want the word of God to be engaging and active in our lives, and we want to be doers of the word and not just hearers of the word, we have to have the word. Right? David said, your word I've hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. I, I want it as a part of my life. And so for the next few weeks, we're just going to go through the book of James. So you should bring your Bibles. We'll have it up here, but bring your Bibles to make some notes and all that fun stuff. Or your digital that you can tap in and type in. Hallelujah. So here's how it's going to look. We're just going to go through every chapter in James. We're going to break it apart. We're going to peel apart some of the powerful things that God is saying to us. There's five chapters in James. That does not mean that we're going to be done in five weeks. We're just going to let God lead us and, and just get some of these things active in our life. Is that all right? Good. I'm glad you're on board because we were going to do it anyway. I guess I would have known if you weren't on board if your seat was empty next week, right? <laughs> Amen. James chapter 1. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. So here's, here's the first kind of little lesson that James teaches us. Imagine starting out a letter like this. There surely is a lot more encouraging ways to start out a letter than, my brethren, verse 2, count it all joy, when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. I know we just all cringe at that word patience. The testing of your faith produces patience. Watch this, verse 4. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Hallelujah. Let's just stop there for a second. Verse, I'm going to read verse 2 and 3 and 4 again. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now, I don't want to speak for you, and I don't want to speak for how you feel, but I can't remember the last time that I, as to quote uh, James, the last time I fell into a trial and was overcome by joy. <laughs> How many would acknowledge with me, usually when you go through times and you go through uh, times that are uncertain or times that are confusing, times that are, quote, testing, right? Usually when you go through those times, there's a search that you have to do to find joy. It's like, how can I find joy in this moment? How can I produce peace? How can I create a smile in the middle of turmoil? But to go back to what Shelley was talking about, I believe, at the beginning of the service, the second line of the song that we sang is, when he comes and sorrow comes to try to steal the joy that I own. Everyone say, I own. Hallelujah. That I own. And one of the things that, that, one of the things that is the enemy of patience, all right, one of the things that is the enemy of patience is the lack of understanding that no matter what right now looks like, 
understanding that I have him in me, I have all of him in me. Hallelujah. We use that phrase, Christ in us, Christ in us. Oh, I have Christ living in us. I have his spirit living in us. The Holy Spirit is living on the inside of me. And we quote it and we're like, oh, praise God, hallelujah. But we have to come to the understanding and really stand on the understanding that when we have him in us, we have everything that he is in us. Hallelujah. So he is the God of love. So we have love in us that casts out per all fear. He is a God of peace. So we have peace in us that passes understanding. Hallelujah. When I'm weak, when I need strength, Paul said he besought the Lord thrice for this thorn to be removed from him, but God's response was, my grace is sufficient for thee. How is his grace sufficient for me? How is his grace enough? That word sufficient doesn't really mean sufficient like we look at sufficient, like barely enough. It means more than enough. More than you could possibly need lives on the inside of us. How could it be that when I'm weak, I am strong? There's things in the scripture that to the natural mind just don't add up and don't make sense. When I am weak, then I am strong. How many would agree with me that has zero human logic to it? When I'm at my weakest, I'm at my strongest. Why? Why? Because his strength is made perfect when I'm weak. Now, I want us to understand what his perfect strength looks like. It took a breath of his strength to breathe on the sea and part it so a couple of million people could walk through on dry land. It took three words, let there be, and everything in the universe came into existence. Hallelujah. It took three words spoken by Jesus looking into a tomb with a dead man that was wrapped in dead man's clothes and had been buried for four days and stank from death and smelled and reeked of the death that had overcome him. And Jesus just said, Lazarus, come forth. Just a drop of God's strength in three words and death was defeated by life. Lazarus stood up out of the tomb. The stench of death disappeared. And when they removed the clothes from him that represented his death, he was just as alive as he was before he got sick with just a drop of the strength of God. Hallelujah. With just a drop of strength. He spoke to the clouds and they created rain and it rained for 40 days and for 40 nights with just a drop of his strength. He said it's time to stop and the land began to dry up with just a drop of his strength. Pharaoh let the children of Israel go with just a drop of his strength. He rained plague after plague after plague on Egypt while protecting and shielding the children of Israel in Goshen with just a drop of his strength. But the Bible says that when I am at my weakest, when the enemy has beaten me down, when life has beaten me down, when I have beaten me down, his strength is made perfect or complete. <laughs> Glory to God. His strength is made complete in my weakness. So when I am at my weakest moment, the entire completeness of the strength of God is wrapped up in one package and dwells on the inside of me, and I walk in his perfect strength. Oh, somebody give him praise this morning. That's why I can take joy. My joy, listen to me, my joy doesn't come from the trial. It doesn't come from the test, but I have joy in the trial and in the test. Hallelujah. How many in here would love to walk from here to co-op in the middle of January with ice on the roads in a t-shirt and a pair of shorts, no shoes and no socks? 
Didn't see any hands up go so far. How many would love to do that if you knew there was a suitcase with $10 million waiting at co-op if all you had to do was put on a t-shirt, shorts, no socks, and no shoes, and walk from here to co-op? Come on. The journey looks different when you know the destination. Can I say that again? The journey looks different when you know the destination. It looks different when you understand that at the end of that journey is a blessing that God's giving you that you didn't have before you took the journey. Hallelujah. He endured the cross, despised the shame. Why did he do that? For the joy that was set before him. Hallelujah. It's when you understand the destination. When you understand who is in control and who is in charge, and you understand who the rewarder is. When you get that at the end of every test, every trial, every problem, every issue, every mountain, every valley, every raging river, when I am walking with Him, at the end of this, I'm going to come forth better, stronger, more blessed, more in relationship with Christ than I was when I went in, then I can count it all joy. Hallelujah. Does that make sense this morning? I count it all joy when I fall into various trials and tests. Why? Because the trial and the test don't mean anything to me. The destination means something to me. What's coming at the end of this thing? Nobody wants to go through the fire. Nobody wants to go through the process of the fire. Nobody wants to go through those moments when God is chipping junk away from our life and when God is turning the heat up so that we can purify ourselves. But when we understand that the destination is that when we are tried by fire, we come forth as pure gold. When I know what the end is, the journey seems a little bit lighter and I can count it all. Hallelujah. I'm not happy when it's hot. But when I know the result of the heat is gold. Hallelujah. These things that we go through, these moments that we have, these tests, these trials, these, these issues that we have in life, sometimes when they're right in front of us, they seem massive, and they seem huge, and they seem like they will never be overcome. But if we can always remember that as long as God is for us, who can be against us? Hallelujah. As long as we remember that it's the trying of our faith, it's these moments in these times and tests and trials that our faith is being tried. Listen, we kind of look at that from a different perspective. I want you to hear this. We've kind of twisted what that means, the trying of our faith produces patience. We've kind of twisted it, and the enemy has twisted it in our minds to convince us that what that means is God wants to prove whether you have faith or not. And God's looking down at you, and he wants to put your faith to the test to see how close you are to him. That's not what he's saying. He's saying situations, circumstances, issues that you go through that are trying your faith, that produces patience. You can only have real patience when you have an assurance of the outcome. I want to say that again. You only have real patience let me change the word. When you have confidence in the outcome. When you are confident that the end is going to be greater than the beginning you have patience because you understand this too, this too shall pass. Hallelujah. The most painful thing you can ever go through is going to pass. 
And if you understand that your hope is not in the things of this world, but it is in God and it is in the powerful uh, providence that He places in your life, then you can have patience during that process and understand that if I stay in the process and not try to run away and escape, if I keep one step ahead of the next step, ahead of the next step, ahead of the next step, I understand that I'm not making those moves by myself. I'm making those moves with God. Hallelujah. And in my 45, almost 46 years of living, there has not been been a moment where God has left me to make the moves by myself. There hasn't been a moment where God has looked at me and said, you're going to have to figure this one out. I'm going to leave you to it. Every move I've made, He has walked with me. He has talked with me. He has guided me. When I didn't listen and I messed up, but my heart was towards Him, He put my steps back in order again. That's breeds patience. That's why it produces patience. That's why the trying of our faith produces patience. Right? Hope that is seen is not hope. For if you've already seen it, why do you yet hope for it? Right? It breeds patience. How many in here would lift a hand and say you are a very patient person? <laughs> My wife always says she prayed for patience and God gave her twins. <laughs> it is the trying of our faith that produces, I love that word, produces patience. Patience. Do you know what the enemy of patience is? Anxiety and fear. That's the enemy of patience. Because if you're trying to wait to see something and you're trying to wait on God and you're having faith in God for the situation, whatever it might be, it is fear and anxiety and uncertainness and, 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 and confusion. It's all of those things that are all uh, branches from the tree of fear, right? All of those things cause you to jump ahead of it. It causes you to make bad decisions. It causes you to lose heart. It causes you to get discouraged. That's the enemy of patience because patience says, I don't know what my next step looks like, but I know who's guiding my steps. I don't know what tomorrow morning looks like, but I know who's going to be there with me tomorrow morning. I don't know what all the answers are. Hear me. The, the most freeing thing, I've said this before, but the most freeing thing in my life when it comes to faith is this. I lost the need to know the answers. I've lost the need to know all the details of how God's going to do what God's going to do. My trust is not in the details. My trust is in the one that creates the path in the first place. And so I understand that even in the trying of my faith, I know that God doesn't leave me because my faith is being tried. In fact, when my faith is being tried, God is nearer to me than He ever has been. Hallelujah. That's when he steps in and says, I know you're in a moment where your strength can't carry you, so I'm going to step in with my perfect strength, and then you're going to have more than enough because you're coming out the other side of this. Listen, that is the end of every discussion and every story with every test and every trial. If you walk with him and you allow him to move in your life, you are coming out the other side better than you were when you went in. That breeds patience. That breeds patience. Hallelujah. But watch what he says in verse 4. Let patience have its perfect work. Hallelujah. Patience have its perfect work. I want everyone to say this with me. Reject fear. 
reject anxiety, receive patience. Reject fear and anxiety and receive patience. The end of fear and the end of anxiety, the end result of that is chaos. The end result of fear is surrender to the circumstance. The end result of patience is surrender to the will of God. That's important. When we surrender to the circumstance and we look at what the moment is and we surrender to that and we accept the results, listen now, we accept the results of what the moment tells us the results are going to be. I've talked about this before. There's a difference between diagnosis and prognosis, right? Diagnosis tells you what is happening right now. Prognosis tells you what the result is going to be of what is happening right now. The diagnosis can be accurate, but the prognosis can be adjusted according to your faith. And the prognosis can be changed according to the act of God intercepting and interfering on your behalf. Hallelujah. So we have to come to the point where our trying of our faith and our believing in God, because here's what faith is. Listen now. Faith is what builds trust. Faith says, I believe God can do it. I believe God's able. I believe in God's process. Trust is the level that you come to when you say, I don't understand the process, I don't understand what looks like in front of me, I don't know why it hasn't happened yet, I don't understand why it hasn't turned around, I don't understand why it hasn't worked, but I'm going to lay back into the arms of God because I know as long as I'm walking in Him and He is walking in me, the ship don't sink when the captain's asleep at the bottom of the boat. Hallelujah. Praise God. Simple stuff, but so powerful. The ship ain't going to sink when Jesus is in it. Your, your issues are not going to overwhelm you when you have Jesus with you in your issues. Trust is the level. Watch this. The trying of our faith produces what? You could very easily say the trying of your faith works trust. Produces trust. Because patience comes from trust. Right? Patience doesn't come. We talked about this, I believe, I believe on Tuesday night. On uh, Tuesday night. But faith, faith isn't an abstract thing. Faith is not an abstract, um, you know, magical thing, that mystical thing that we have in our life. Faith is accepting the facts that God has spoken. That's what faith is. Faith is facts. Everyone say faith is facts. That's why Hebrews says now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. Faith is fact. Faith is not saying I'm believing for some mystical thing to happen. I'm believing for some great movement or motion to happen. Faith is saying I just believe what God said. That's what faith is. Faith is just believing what God said. So the trying... The trying of your belief in what God says produces patience because you know who you believe in. Hallelujah. Because faith is not believing for something, it's believing in someone. Hallelujah. That's why oftentimes our faith gets wavy and roller coaster like because we're believing for a miracle, for a blessing, for healing for finances, for peace, for family being saved, for this and for this and for this. I'm not believing for anything. I'm believing in God. 
And when my faith is placed in Him, I understand, like Abraham, every place that I put my foot, He's going to give to me. Not because I've earned it or I deserve it, but because He already owns it. Hallelujah. Let patience have its perfect work. Why? What's the result of patience having its perfect work? That you may be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. Wow. Hallelujah. Can I tell you something? If you have Christ living in you, you're already lacking nothing. You say, well, what about this pain in my body? Or what about this problem in my mind? What about this bill that needs to get paid? Your body, your mind, those things may not have caught up to the reality that is is in Christ, but the reality is, if you have Him, you have everything. Because it's all in Him. Hallelujah. Can we just lift a hand and love him this morning? Watch verse 5. This is interesting. He's talking about lacking nothing. He said, if you have, let patience do its perfect work, you'd be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. And instantly goes into, if you lack wisdom, (laughs) think of that transition. You'll be lacking nothing. Now, if any of you lacks wisdom... Let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. This is a really interesting lesson. I want to stop here and and just kind of say something. James 1 is most known for two verses. There are two verses that are more quoted out of the book of James than probably any other verses. And in chapter 1, those two verses sit right in the center of it. When it says, don't be deceived. Right? Every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down. And we rejoice on all of that. But the stuff that he says around that is what brings us to the understanding of that. Somebody say amen. If any of you lack wisdom, verse 5, let him ask of God. Those people up in the booth are going to have so much fun over the next few weeks because I'm just going to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. I hope their trigger finger is good. (laughs) You pick the right day, Hannah, to be sitting down here, I can tell you that. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who what? Gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Wisdom. Everyone say wisdom. If I need wisdom, if I'm going to understand, let's back up. If I'm going to allow patience to work in my life, I need wisdom. I need God's wisdom. Come on. Why do I need his wisdom? Why do I need his wisdom operating in my life? It's not complicated. He knows everything. He knows the end from the beginning. He calls things that are not as though they already were. He created everything. And he's already there waiting for the end of everything. Yet he's a present help in time of trouble. So if I'm going to ask and seek for wisdom, I'm going to seek wisdom from the one who knows everything. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah. If I need help with my car, I'm not calling a carpenter. If I need help with building a house, I'm not going to call a mechanic. If I need, right? if I need help you know, with a dental appointment, I'm not going to call a masseuse. I want to go to the one that has the knowledge and the understanding of that specific thing. And God has the knowledge and understanding of every specific thing. 
So in order to, oh hallelujah, in order for us to walk in that faith, and in order for us to count all joy when we go through these things, and let our patience perfect itself, and let our patience work to make us complete, perfect, lacking nothing. Lacking nothing just doesn't mean money and health. and It also means wisdom. Lacking nothing. Watch this. But verse 6 brings it back around again. What a statement to what a statement to, to meditate on. You lack wisdom, ask of God because He'll give you liberally. Hallelujah. God's not trying to keep what He knows from you. Did you hear what I said? He's not trying to keep what he knows from you. He's trying to position you so you can walk in what he knows. Hallelujah. Verse 6, But let, let him ask in faith with no doubting. Let him ask in faith with no doubting. Ask for what? He just said wisdom. Let him ask in faith with no doubting. God, listen, I, I think we need to spend more time with this prayer. Hold on. Just don't judge me yet. Let me finish what I'm saying. We spend so much time praying for our problems to be solved that I think we forget to sometimes come to God and say, God, I need your wisdom when dealing with this issue. Come on. We oftentimes just come to God on a consistent basis. Solve my problem, fix my issue. Solve my problem, fix my issue. Solve my problem, fix my issue. But we need to come to Him sometimes and say, God, I need your wisdom in this moment because there's times that we are facing issues that it's a moment where God can use and allow us to look in the mirror and figure out some things that we need to adjust about ourselves so that the next Next time we go into a similar issue, we already have the experience and the wisdom on how to deal with that issue. Am I speaking correct this morning? So he says, while he's talking about your faith perfecting and doing its work to make you complete, perfect, and lacking nothing, he adds in, if you don't have wisdom, ask God for it. He'll give it to you liberally. Hallelujah. That's why Solomon was such a standout. Because Solomon didn't ask for the solutions to his problems. Solomon didn't ask for wealth and riches and money and fame. Solomon said, I want wisdom. I want wisdom. Do you know what wisdom is? Do you know what asking? Oh, hallelujah. Do you know what asking God for wisdom is? It's saying, God, adjust my thoughts to your understanding. Oh, glory to God. Think about the power of that prayer. It is saying, God, adjust my thoughts, my decisions, my knowledge, what I know. Adjust that so it lines up with what you know and with what you see. And when that happens, patience can get its final work because we can see then that God's got it taken care of even when we don't see it done. Do you understand that when God says it's done, it's done from His perspective. It might not be completed in your world for three months, but to Him it's already done because He's the present, past, and future who was, is, and is to come, the Almighty God. But He says, ask it in faith. With no doubting. Hallelujah. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Back in verse 6. Hmm. Now when we read that scripture, the first thought process in our mind is, well, there's times that I doubt. There's times that I doubt. 
How many in here would be honest and acknowledge your faith isn't 100% every time you go to God? No, 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 no. no. Let's back up. Let's back up. Your faith is always 100%. Your belief in your faith sometimes isn't 100%. Because <laughs> faith is a God process, and God processes work. Amen? We operate on the faith of the Son of God. That is perfect all the time. Our understanding of that faith sometimes falters, and there's sometimes where doubt seeps in. That's why when Jesus looked at his disciples over and over and over again, it wasn't their level of faith that he addressed, it was their moment of doubt that he addressed. Because, listen, this is so important, so important. If you can address and deal with the doubt and the unbelief, your faith is already on the inside of you. Because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. I believe it was last week or maybe Tuesday I mentioned this, right? If I look at you and say by his stripes you are healed, you have heard the word that he took the stripes for your healing. You have heard that word. That word is in you. It has be built and placed and produced faith for healing in your life. What we have to do is deal with the unbelief and the doubt. And then when we come to him having dealt with the doubt and unbelief, and our faith then isn't wavering, right? We'll have what we ask of him. But watch what he says. For that man, he who tries to combine faith with doubting. Now, I'm almost done for this morning, but I've, I've, I've got to do this. Forgive me, but I've got to do this. You've got to stop trying to combine your faith with doubt and hoping for a godly solution. Everyone just got hush silent. You've got to stop trying to combine faith with doubt and hope for a God solution. Here's some phrases that we hear. I believe God's going to blank, but if he doesn't, I believe this is going to work, but if it doesn't, I believe God's going to take me to that spot, but if I don't get there, how many would agree with me that but is the biggest little word in the English language? There's two words that are bigger than any other word, but little tiny words. But and if. The moment we add but and if into our conversations of faith, guess what happens? Shout it out. Yeah. Doubt. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to come to God in faith, and it's combining with doubt, right? And that's why it's like a sea tossed. Come on. That's why it's like this. You know what a sea toss, a wave does? There's a couple of us in here from the East Coast. I won't point any fingers. But you know what a wave does? It does this. Whoosh. The biggest, largest of ships can disappear behind a wave. And moments later, they can be on the top of the crest and back in again. And that's what happens when we try to move forward with a combination of faith and doubt. We have to say what we believe and believe what we say. Come on. Now hold on to me now. Hold on, hold on for a second. Right? That doesn't mean come up with your own stuff. That doesn't mean come up with your own stuff. 
Don't walk out of here this morning and say, well, I'm believing that sitting on the front seat of my car when I leave is going to be $10 million, a basket full of homemade molasses cookies and some homemade bread, and get to your vehicle and they're not all sitting there and think, well, I guess God let me down. No, no, no. Whatsoever things you desire when you pray, when you filter it through your prayer and get the heart and mind of God, you will receive it. Right? That's why before it says asking faith, nothing wavering, it says ask for wisdom. Ask for wisdom. Here's what verse 7 and 8 says. Stand with me this morning. Let, that, let not that man suppose, this is a real, this is such a, I don't know what word I'm looking for. This is such a just real sounding statement here. Let, that, let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. What man? The man that is combining faith with doubt. Because God's wisdom, hallelujah, God's wisdom brings pure faith. Because you're then speaking from the understanding of what God knows. Hallelujah. That word suppose, think about it like this. Every time you're speaking in faith, ask yourself this question. Are you speaking based on what you suppose? Or are you speaking based on what God knows? Hallelujah. There are things, there are things that you do not have to question God's will on. The Bible says, pray everything you pray, and I'm paraphrasing, according to the will of the Lord. Right? Some people take that to mean everything I pray, I need to say, Lord, if it's your will, fill in the blank. This is his will and testament. So if it's, in, if it's in the book, it's his will. Come on. So when I pray for blessings in your life, I'm praying the will of God. Your problem is, is you've got a distorted view of what blessings might look like. When I'm praying for strength, I'm praying the will of God. There is never a moment ever in my life, if you ever hear me slip up and say it, smack me in the back of the head, it will correct me and shake my brain straight. There is never a moment that I will ever pray for anybody that is sick and say, Lord, if it's your will, heal them. By his stripes, you're healed. Does it say, does it say that he died on the cross for a few but not all? No, he died for every man, right? Right? The scourging, the whipping, the bruising, the chastisement of our peace, the stripes for healing, all part of the same process. So he didn't die for some, he died for all. He didn't take the stripes for some people's healing and not others, he took the stripes for all. There's things that when we pray, we have to know the will of God, and that's why he says, ask God for wisdom. So that when we are speaking by faith, we're speaking His will. How many believes every promise in the book is for you? Good thing, because it is. It is. So when you're declaring those promises in your life, you're not guessing. You're speaking out of the knowledge of what God has spoken into your life. So you can take doubt out of it when wisdom comes in and the understanding of God's purposes Doubt disappears because we are no longer speaking out of hope and mystical faith. We are speaking out of God fact, God wisdom, and what God has spoken is reality in your life. Somebody just take a second and love him. Hallelujah. Let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord, the one that is operating out of doubt combined with faith and not in the wisdom of God. Why? Because he is a double-minded man Unstable in all his ways. Why is he a double-minded man? 
because he's trying to combine human logic with God's purposes. How many ever tried to figure out what God was up to using your own logic? Did you ever get it figured out? Or did you just come to the place where you just had to say, I'm going to have to trust God because none of this makes sense to me. And when we can come to that place that we just trust Him because of the wisdom that we have asked Him to implant in us, we'll be patient. And when pay, the work of patience is complete, what happens in our lives? We are made perfect, complete, lacking nothing. Hallelujah. Because we're walking in the understanding that God has. And when that happens, when that happens, yeah, we can count it all joy. We can count it all joy for the fulfillment of God's purpose and plans in our life. I can endure a little bit of this because of what he's got waiting right there. It has been my experience the devil, devil never fights unless you're in opposition of him. I don't see too many times where the devil just launches a war against somebody he's already defeated. Kingdom divided against itself doesn't stand. He knows this. If he's fighting you, God's got something ready for you. Let your faith produce patience and let your patience work and you will be complete, lacking nothing. Seek his wisdom with all faith and no doubt. And you won't be a double-minded man, you'll be a single-focused man or woman. And God will get you to where he's going. Can we lift a hand and love him this morning? Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this word. Because, Lord, it's not our word. Hallelujah. It's not our word. Kelvin, could you come and get ready to close in prayer this morning? It's not our word. It is your word, and it is for us as your people. And, Lord, even the little portion that we have read this morning in the beginning of this series on the book of James, Lord, we just pray that you would make it active in our lives, that we would seek your wisdom. Because your wisdom, the backtracking path is that your wisdom helps us have patience. Your wisdom creates patience in our life because it helps us have faith in you, not the circumstance, not the solution, but in you. Our faith is not in things. It is from you. It is in you. And we believe in what you are capable and willing to do. Let us not be double-minded. Let us not come to you with faith mixed with doubt. Let us come to you in your wisdom and understanding, knowing you've got it figured out before we ever got here. Before we got to the door, you had the lock figured out. Before we got to the field, you had the harvest ready. Before we got to our pain, you had healing. Before we got to depression, you had peace. Before we got to fear, you had perfect love that casts out all fear. Let us lean and rely on you and your wisdom because we know that's the only thing that is going to create and bring us to a place of completeness and lacking nothing. And we thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your word to us this morning. I thank you for the book of James, Lord, and your wisdom to us, God. I thank you that, Lord, as you say in your word that we will face trials and tribulations, but you don't leave us hanging there, God. I thank you that you've promised us that we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord God, that you have made us the head and not the tail. And I thank you, Lord God, for your promises to us and um, Lord I think of the Israelites as they were promised the promised land and yet they still had to go in and face their enemies to take the promised land and I thank you God for your wisdom and I ask wisdom for all of us today God 
to walk out, Lord, your promises that you've promised us, to give us the wisdom and the understanding to walk in what you've called us into, Lord God. I thank you for everyone here today, God, and I declare your blessing upon each one, Lord. I thank you, God, for your faithfulness to everyone here, to all that we go through, God. I thank you that you are good to us. And I pray your blessing, God, upon this, this week, Lord, as we, as we enter into uh, your wisdom and are filled with your spirit as you lead and guide us into all truth, Father. We're so grateful for all that you've done for us and all that you're doing and will do for us, God. We praise you and we thank you this morning in Jesus' name.